Thank you, Brother Eric. Thank you to everyone who is joining us and to those that may be watching online. And uh, happy Thanksgiving week to everybody. So today we are continuing our study in the book of Malachi. Uh, if you've been with us for any length of time in the past few weeks or actually a couple of months now, uh, you would know that we're going through Malachi. We started chapter 1, verse 1, and we've worked our way. Today we'll be finishing chapter 3. And then one more chapter, and we will have concluded the book of Malachi. So today we're going to focus on chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. So if you have your Bibles, please open it up to Malachi 3, starting at verse 13. And if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. The inerrant word of God says, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, How have we spoken against you? You have said, It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test. And they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And the book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. As we reflect upon your instruction this morning of serving you, may we come to you, Lord, serving you with a heart that is joyful, with a heart that is willing to learn, with a, with a, a heart and mind that is willing to turn to you, Lord, to repent in the areas that we need to repent. And that only in that we would be assured to find peace, peace with you and peace in our lives. Be with us now, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so thus far, we're finishing up chapter 3 of the book of Malachi. Let's take a quick survey of what we've seen in the book of Malachi so far. The book of Malachi consists of several disputations. What is a disputation in this case specifically? A disputation is when God brings an accusation, a statement. He calls out his people and says, this is what you're doing. This is what I'm seeing that you're doing. This is what I know that you're doing. And the people come back and said, hmm, but I'm not doing that. And then God brings forth the evidence for each of those claims that he is calling his people out on. So just to recap, what are some of these disputations, this back and forth between God and his people that we've seen thus far? First off, before God starts rebuking them and calling them out, the first thing he says is to his people, I have loved you. That's the first thing he says to them. The people reply by saying, really? How have you loved us? Basically saying, you haven't loved us at all. Then God says, you have despised my name. The people reply and say, really? How have you despised your name? We haven't done that. Then God says, you have been faithless to one another, and I have rejected your offerings. The people turn around and say, why do you not accept our offerings? What am I doing wrong? God then says, you have wearied me with your words. Then the people say, really? I have worried you down. How have we done that? We were not aware of that. Then God says, return to me. And the people say, 
but how shall we return? Given the understanding of we've been here all along. How, how do you want us to return to you? And then God says, which Pastor Kevin preached last week, you are robbing me from what belongs to me. And the people turn around and say, really, how are we robbing you? We've been faithful all along. Right? So the pattern here becomes clear. The general attitude of the people of God is not one that asks a question to better understand God. But they more or less ask a rhetorical question with an attitude of saying, we haven't done that. God, you're, you're wrong. You're, you're lying. That's the attitude that we see from the people of God. This is likened to when a parent catches their child red-handed in disobedience or speaking evil, speaking wrongly. And you tell the child, please don't talk back to me with an attitude. And the child will say, I'm not giving you an attitude. You want me to show you what an attitude is? Right. The wrongdoing response of the people of God is to say, we haven't done that. Denying what God is calling them out on. So then the general theme here in the book of Malachi, if we, lose, if we look close enough, quickly, if we're honest, we start to see ourselves in the place of the people of God. That when God says, why have you been doing this? When we read God's word, and the word of God says that it's like a mirror, it'll show you an accurate reflection of who you are. And we start saying, no, I, I'm not, I mean, I may not be perfect, but I'm not that bad. Then we fall in the same position as the children of Israel are illustrated as being done here in the book of Malachi. And then when we find ourselves in that position, we may be coming and attending service. We may be getting involved in the things of God. We may become people who are serving God, so to speak. But then we are not only not fulfilled, but it seems as though serving God is actually pointless, it's fruitless, it's worthless. And hence the sermon title for today, When Serving God Seems Fruitless. So we will explore some of the reasons why this could be so. We find no joy in being involved in the things of God. We seem to have no priority for the things of God. And we're going to see why that may be. Again, what the scripture says to us, it's like a mirror that tells us this is why. And what will be our response? Well, that's not me. Again, we fall back into being just like the people of Israel when God calls them out. So this will, this will be done in four major ideas. The first two apply to the theme of the book of the disputations which is the words of man, what we say to God, versus the words of God, what God says. The words of man versus the word of God. Secondly, we're going to look at the, the denial of men of any wrongdoing. Then the next two will be very important here in the book of Malachi because this is where the book of Malachi takes a turn for the better. It seems as though finally there's a breakthrough. And the people of God, it says, those who fear God got together. And there's a sign of hope, a sign of repentance of those who feared God. This is long overdue. The book of Malachi has been denial after denial after denial. And finally, there seems to be some conviction there. And then the last point will be God's promise. God's promise to his people and God's warning to those that don't heed his word. So a question for today as we study God's word is, do I serve God? And if so, do I think of it as fruitless? Is it inconvenient? Is it getting in the way of the things I actually want to do, of the things that are actually important to me? Or maybe I am serving God, but I'm not joyful at all. I see it as a burden. I'm like, man, I wish this was like not on my back right now. It's just such a burden. Or maybe you could be honest and say, I'm not serving God at all, and I'm cool with it, right? You can be honest with God. He's not afraid of that. 
So let's begin. First, the words of man versus the word of God. First verse we read there, the first half of that verse, 13, says, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. This is God speaking. The words of man. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. So then here and elsewhere in scripture, we learn that the words that we speak, the words of men, have the ability to destroy or have the ability to build up. Okay? The problem is that without submission to God, the words of men will always end up being destructive, even if you intend well. In the long run, if you're not under God's submission, in, the submission, in submission to God, your words will only bring destruction. Why is that? Well, Jeremiah 79 tells us that, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our heart in this default condition is wicked. That's the natural state out of the box, every human being. Then Jesus in Matthew 15, 18 says that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that is what defiles a person. Right? Evil heart, our own desires, selfish motives, wickedness. Our mouth, when we speak honestly, describes the condition of our heart. And that's why the words of men, without being in submission to God, are evil. The words of rebellious people are grievances against God. Bad heart, bad speech, we offend God. Now let's take a quick look at the word of God. The word of man, now the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divisions of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's just for starters. The word of God is strong, it's true, it's alive. It'll cut you. And then 2 Timothy 3.16, we should all know that scripture. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So we quickly, we quickly see the contrast. The word of man versus the word of God. God always speaks truth, always builds up, always corrects, always instructs, which leads us to being trained in righteousness, ultimate righteousness, not just being a good person, but true righteousness. Therefore, we have to be in submission to the word of God in order for our words to be edifying, for our words to be true, instead of bringing grievances against God. So then God says that those words of, of the people that are in disobedience, he says, those words have been hard against me. This is an indication that these people have acted and complained to God with a very stern contempt. They're persistent in their complaint and in their claim that God has not been good to them. Think of this as a child who has been brought up by a very loving father, hardworking a provider has provided home, shelter, love, care for their child. And as their child is coming of age, perhaps a teenager, comes to his dad and says, Dad, why haven't you loved me? Why haven't you provided for me? As a matter of fact, a stranger would probably do a better job than you. Attitude of grievance, attitude of ungratefulness how much more would our words be harsh against God when we don't acknowledge his blessing because even if we don't have a good earthly father our heavenly father for sure is a good father so then when God says that your words have been harsh against me let's not read a modern meaning into it what do I mean well, God doesn't mean, give me a safe space. I'm offended by your speech. Right? He doesn't mean that. That is 
something that we see today as people being offended by what is said. For instance, in college campuses, they literally have these things called safe spaces. Because the children, and I call them children because I'm old enough now, college kids, college kids by and large have been indoctrinated into thinking that any viewpoint that disagrees with them is hate speech and they need a safe space. Now make no mistake, that type of mentality carries itself to the workforce because this is what these kids are learning. And furthermore, it is also infiltrated into the churches. Make sure you don't say certain things because those things are offensive, okay? So there's great consequences to that concept of harsh words. But in any case, that's not what God means. What does God mean? God is making a point here that these types of grievances, these type of ungratefulness, rebellion from his people is bringing a continual grievance to the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, and now he's calling them out on it. They have lifted the rebel fist against God and God is telling them, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. So what is the response of the people to this accusation that they have been harsh, persistent, stern with their words against God? What is the response to that disputation? Denial. They come back and say, really? I thought we've done that. So it's the second part of the verse. Now let's look, take a look at the second point, which is the denial of wrongdoing. But you say, how have we spoken against you? Many times, the typical response to an accusation when one is guilty is fierce denial. No, I didn't do that. Right? God has called them out on the rebellion and the complaining, their ungratefulness. And they practically turn to God and say, God, you are lying. We haven't done that. Have we ever called God a liar? Maybe I can say, I mean, maybe I've not always believed in God. Maybe I've always have not agreed with what the word says, but I haven't gone as far as saying that God is a liar. Well, again, what is one of the first signs of somebody that is guilty of an accusation? A look for justification and denial, right? So... Maybe we should ask that, that ourselves a little bit deeper. When it comes to the denial of wrongdoing against God, the truth is that we are either guilty of it now or we have been guilty of it in the past. How so? Well, the words of man versus the word of God. A couple of classic examples of the words of man when it comes to the, to the things of God is people often say, I am a good person. I don't need God. Don't, don't bring that to me. I'm good. God says, there is no one righteous, no one good, no, not one. The claim of man versus the claim of God. Another quick example. Somebody can say, well, you know, I, I can find my own way to God. I can meditate my way to whatever higher power I believe in. And that will bring me some sort of peace, justification, better philosophy of life, etc. That's what the word of men a lot of times says. But what does God say? Jesus Christ, God Almighty, God incarnate. What does he say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no exception clauses to that. Don't care if you're the Pope. Don't care if you're Hitler. Don't care if you're a Satanist. Don't care if you're sitting in a Christian church pew. No excuses, no passes. You don't come through the true Jesus, you don't make it to the Father. So what is the key here then? If we deny what God says in Scripture, either by ignorance, because we don't know, or knowingly, we know what the Scripture says, but we don't accept it, we reject it, then we too have fallen into this category of calling God a liar. But God, that's not true. I have my own truth. And very soon, then, we again fit in the category with the rebellious Israelites of the book of Malachi. 
Our own words are against us. Our attitude shows it. And we have no joy in serving God. So then God, being gracious, he actually comes and presents some evidence to them. The first piece of evidence is in verse 14. He says, you have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? It is vain to serve God. That word vain, in the Hebrew, it means worthless, futile, inconsequential, of no profit. The word serve, to serve God, it means to follow in God's ways. And it could be extended to serve specifically in a ministry. For the work of God. To be involved in the things of God. They have said all that. It's in vain. Pointless. Fruitless. Worthless. It's a burden. I hate it. But alright. I'll check the box. I'll go. Have we ever fallen in that category? If we are honest. All of us will have to say that yes. At some point. Or even now we have been falling there. So that's a wrong type of thinking. Why? Because that doesn't bring any joy. It is a burden. We can ask ourselves, why do I have this attitude? You know, how is reading the Bible going to help me? How is attending a church service going to benefit me? Let alone committing myself to the things of God, to serve consistently at church, get involved. How is that going to help me? When we see scripture, we realize that this type of attitude lead us to a man-centered way of looking at God. Everything is about us. Everything is about our lives. Man-centered. And it's not God-centered. This type of attitude happens at worst because we have adopted a consumeristic attitude. Okay, I'm going to give some of my time, some of my talents, some of my treasures... But what is in it for me? Let me weigh to see if it's worth me committing to such, to such proposition as it would be the things of God. And at best, we may sincerely think that the reason we should get close to God is so that God can deliver the goods. Please give me an easier life. Like I, I hate being fill in the blank. I need something better, God, so please give it to me. That's the wrong type of thinking, man-centered thinking of approaching God. The right type of thinking would be, God, I want to serve you because you are my creator, because you are holy, because you are righteous, because you are perfect, because you are worthy of my devotion, and because you love me, because you have called me, because you have had mercy on me. As a father, I tell you, one of the biggest blessings of being an earthly father has been in a couple occasions when my daughter has come close to me. She's sat in my lap. Then I ask her, what do you want? What, what can I do for you? And a couple of times her response has been, nothing, daddy. I just want to sit in your lap because I love you. How much more should our attitude be towards our Heavenly Father? To praise Him, to worship Him, to serve Him because He is worthy of it. Because He is Creator. Because He has given His only begotten Son. How much more should our attitude of serving be towards our Heavenly Father? than to an earthly father. Yet, some of us may be thinking, but you know what? That sounds good, but you don't understand. I really don't need to serve God. What I really need is, and then we start filling the blank. What I really need is my health to get better. What I really need is a better financial situation. What I really need is another job. What I really need is peace with my spouse. What I really need is my parents to stop fighting. What I really need is 
How is going to church? How is reading the Bible? How is all that mumble jumble going to help me? That's not what I need. Right? Let's be honest. Have we not been there at one point or another? How would then submission to God, to Jesus Christ and his word, how is that going to help us at all? That's an honest question, right? The problem is that in our human nature, we want to fulfill the eternal longings of our heart with the temporary comforts of this world. Whether that's our relationships, whether that is our security and our sustenance and in our possessions, whether that is our status that we're seeking. We have those things because we have an innate, built-in, eternal longing. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says that God has created us with eternity in our heart. But when we channel that in the wrong ways, all we're doing is just creating idols to go after. And as we search, we say, serving God ain't going to help me. Like, I need to go and just chase all these other things. That's what I really need. Well, first of all, God understands where you're at. He knows your thoughts. He knows where you stand. He has not turned a blind eye. Matthew 6, 8 says, your father, meaning God, knows what you need before you ask him. And then a few verses later, in verse 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God knows what we need. He's not blind to it. But we're chasing after all the wrong things. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What is the key here in this couple of passages I just read? It assures that God will provide our every need. Not our every want. More often than not, what, we, what, we're after, what we're out there chasing after is something that we want, not something that we need. Because at the end of the day, when each of us, if we are privileged enough to have a deathbed, and we're not instead crushed instantly by an accident or anything like that, God forbid, if we have time to reflect what did I do with my life, it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to regret studying God's word, that you're going to regret serving God. However, it will be very likely to say, what did I do with my life? What did I do? Chasing after the wrong things and then claiming we have no joy in serving God. Then God presents a second piece of evidence, verse 15. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. They get away with it. This is a very common theme, not only in the book of Malachi, but in scripture overall. That is, the people asking God, why do the evil people do so well? Why do they get away with everything? Look at me, I'm trying to serve you. And this is what I get. Everything goes sideways. Nevertheless, it's an honest question, right? Psalm 73, verse 3 says, For I was envious of the arrogant I saw, as I saw their prosperity. Job 12, 6. The tents of the destroyers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure. Right? The people of God know what it feels. When it seems that the wicked do well and they are being punished. And then we ask ourselves, so why is it that when I'm trying to serve God, everything goes wrong? Everything goes sideways. There's times that I've seen people evangelize. And the proposal to the people that are evangelizing to is accept Jesus and like your life will be better. I don't think that's anywhere in the Bible. As a matter of fact, one thing that I've learned from one of my 
mentors in the faith, he said, if you see someone who is eager to make a commitment for Christ, try to convince them otherwise. Now, be careful with that, right? You don't want to discourage somebody. But what he meant is, Jesus said, count the cost. Count the cost of following him. We ought to be aware of that. So then we see there that we have again a danger of falling into the wrong type of thinking, man-centered thinking about God. Know this, God is sovereign. He's in absolute control of every, every life on earth. And his timing is perfect. So when we think that in our limited knowledge, in our limited time that we have, that the evil are getting away with it, a constant promise that God brings in his word is, I will repay them. I will not be mocked. Justice is coming. But we're thinking, no, I want it now. I want justice now. Like, smack them right now. That's our natural instinct. God says, his ways are not our ways. So don't worry about those people. As a matter of fact, God tells us that he uses wicked people to oppress and judge his own people. He uses that as judgment. So when we say, oh, you know, the U.S. is a Christian nation, like we're God's elect and God's favorite. Look at the scripture. Time after time, God has used evil nations to punish his own people. And yet, one that's done and over with, like in the book of, of Habakkuk, God then deals with the wicked people. Because it's in his timing and in his wisdom with the purpose of bringing his people closer to him. If we are honest, when do people typically come to a genuine, close, loving relationship with their creator? Is there under prosperity or is it under trial, under adversity? Think about that. So don't ever assume that just because the wicked seem to be getting away with their doings, that that's the end of the story. Nope. God will judge. But it will not be in my timing. It's going to be in his timing. So then we turn to the sign of hope. Seems like there's some evidence of repentance going on. Verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him to those who fear the Lord and esteemed his name. A book of remembrance, right? Of those who fear the Lord. That means that something was written like a letter, like a scroll. And again, let us not read our own meaning into this. Does God need a book so that he can remember? Like, oh, let me see if you're on the list. Right? No, God knows. The point here is that God knows those who are his. God knows who his people are. He says that those that fear the Lord gathered and spoke to each other. Those that fear the Lord, those that have the fear of the Lord, the Bible uses that reference to illustrate, to point out who the true believers are. Those that fear the Lord. It's a way of saying those that are under submission to. Those that show respect and reverence to. Those that honor. Those that worship God. Those that fear the Lord. Who do we fear? Or what do we fear? Who is in control of our lives? Is it my reputation? My status? I need to bow down to that, make sure that I serve that. What or who do we fear? Maybe we're holding on to our possessions. We're holding on to our health, ultimately in an unhealthy way. Who are we serving? We, we fear something or someone. 
Is that fear above the fear of God? And if it is, we need to repent. Those who fear the Lord. So it says that they spoke to one another. What happens when believers gather and talk to one another? That should be a time for edification. That should be a time to speak about God, to speak about God's word, about his truth. That should be a time for exhortation. That should be a time to counsel each other. That should be a time to encourage each other. That should be a time to rejoice with each other. That should be a time to mourn with each other, to carry one another's burdens, to walk with each other in this life. It's a call for us to remember that we belong in fellowship. When we are being called out by God because of our rebellious life, if you go out to get worldly counsel, what do you think they're going to tell you? Dude, you're wasting your time. You need to go there. You need to read the Bible. You need to pray. As opposed to meeting with the people of God, having that fellowship, to call each other into repentance, to build each other up. That way, serving God will not seem fruitless or worthless. Because what happens when we feel like serving God or following God is a burden, it's a worthless task? A telltale sign may be that we don't have fellowship with the people of God, with those that fear God. We much prefer fellowship and friendship and spending time with others. And as a church, we are called to walk in this life together. God, in his infinite wisdom, called his people to be the church, to be, what does Ecclesia mean? Those that are separated, those that are set apart, to have that fellowship with each other. When this is done genuinely, not out of compulsion, right? Time and time again, I've seen the testimony of people who said, I left such and such church. Because it was a burden. And not because it was a burden to serve God, but because it was a burden for them to feel obligated and for them to feel that heaviness of legalism that the moment they were out of step, they were smashed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a genuine repentance, conviction to walk and come together with the people of God. So are we then at a point in our life when you can say, I am serving God, I'm following God, I'm involved in the things of God. And I would not be content any other way. Can we have a goal to be at that place, to be at that spot? Not because I have to, no, there's no such thing. Because I want to, because I need to, I long for that fellowship with God and with his people. Or, perhaps if we're honest, we may be at a spot in life where we say, I'm actually fine not serving God. I have no interest. And I'm good. God is not afraid of that attitude. As a matter of fact, that's the type of position that most people in this world fall into. But God does call you to repent, to follow him. Because what does ultimately mean serving God? How do we start? Okay, fine. It seems that I should follow God, that I should serve. How does that start? Well, First of all, you must be born again. You must come to Jesus, confess your sin, know that he is holy, know that he can forgive you, know that he took the punishment for your sin, for your wrongdoing against God, and that by trusting in him, in his perfect life, in his death, in his resurrection, then you have been wiped clean of your sin. God sees you as he would see the perfection of Jesus. You have been justified. Step number one. Become born again. Be a Christian. And then as you start the life of sanctification, the life of the everyday Christian, you then come together with his people. You use your time, your talents, and your treasures to serve him. And again, not begrudgingly, but because you want to. That's more or less how one gets started in serving God. And if we don't know, we're confused. Remember, one of the shortest prayers, or perhaps the shortest prayer in the Bible, came from Peter when he was drowning. He said, Lord, help me. If you don't know where to start, cry out to God, Lord, help me. 
And God honors the humble, contrite spirit that cries out for him. So then, lastly, we look at the promise of God to his people. The last two verses, 17 and 18, read. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not serve him. Okay? So it's a promise and a warning. We see three quick things here. First, God declares that true believers are his treasured possession. Do I live my life as if I'm God's treasured possession? The language user is very strong. It's like very dear, very meaningful to God. He holds you as his treasured possession. This is the identity that we need to remember that we are as Christians. We are God's treasured possession. 1 Peter 2.9 puts it this way, speaking to Christians, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are God's highly treasured possession. Secondly, God will spare his people from judgment. We get the picture here that the human person, an uh, 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 earthly father, would spare his son, right? Who of us who have a, a child would not spare them? Because we love them so much, right? God will spare his people. But make no mistake, that was not cheap. Because in order to do that, God has to give up his only begotten son, his most valuable possession, so to speak. His only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that we can have forgiveness, so that we can be spared. So a human person that loves their child will spare the child. But God the Father did not spare his son, Jesus. Why? Because God so loved the world, that's why, that he gave his only begotten son. Then thirdly, there's a distinction between, here's a warning, the distinction between the wicked and the righteous. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that, you know, it's fine. God is love, and in the end, everybody's going to be fine. Nope. No one gets a pass. Because God is so holy and so righteous that nobody will get a pass. In the New Testament, Jesus speaks of true believers as planted wheat and as non-believers as tares like all the weeds that are annoying when a farmer is trying to to raise the crops the wheat and the tares the farmer will let both grow and at the time of harvest he will separate the two will separate the wheat and everything else is going to be thrown into the fire that's the illustration that Jesus gives and he puts it this way, Matthew 15, 13. Every plant that my father has not planted, it will be rooted up. It's going to be destroyed. A distinction between the people of God and those that are not his. So then, what can we conclude? A few observations here to close. What is my attitude today about serving God, about being involved in the things of God? Just remember, these people were told that their words were harsh against God. We can say, well, I mean, I, I don't clean my face. I don't yell at God and tell him those things. Let's remember that God not only hears our words, but he knows our every thought and he knows our every intention, our attitudes. At the very center of our being, God knows exactly what's in there. So what is our attitude about serving God? Do we see it as following God as something that is worthless, inconvenient? We could quickly jump to our defense and say, no, I mean, I may not be all in, but I mean, 
I don't think it's worthless. Yet, you have little to no commitment to the things of God. We can also say, no, you know what? I, I don't think of the things of God as worthless. Yet, my involvement in serving in the things of God, I see it as a burden. I never do it with joy. As a matter of fact, I wish I didn't have this thing in my back. I wish I could just get rid of it. The key here then is to ask God for repentance. God is the one who will grant us repentance. God will grant repentance to those who seek him in truth, to those that come to him with a contrite spirit, knowing that we need help. Ask God for that repentance and then be obedient. Secondly, we may look at our service to God as worthless because we don't realize that we have been blessed by him immensely. A thankful heart, an attitude of gratitude is the first step into worshiping God as he is worthy. Because we come to him as debtors, not as creditors. Like, God, well, you owe me this. Like, I, I've been good for, for a couple days, maybe. So now, like, deliver. Come on. We don't come to God as debtors. I mean, as creditors. We come to him as debtors. Thirdly, our service to God may seem fruitless because we have not been born again. We're really not Christians, if we're honest, or we are in a backslidden position. And to that again, repent. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to give you the will, the power, the conviction to repent. Confess your sins to Jesus. He will forgive you. And he will, he will give you hope and joy in serving him. And then know that the daily walk of a Christian is not to be done alone. The importance of fellowship. This is the key turning point in the book of Malachi. What happened? The people of God got together, those that feared God. And God heard them. God honored that. They realized we are wrong and we need to repent. Right? Fellowship with the people of God will give us what we need to start to change our attitude. The more we are around the, the people of God, the family of God, the more likely that we're going to serve God with joy and will not see it as pointless and as a burden. It is not God's fault that we may see serving him as a burden. It's my fault. It's your fault. And then lastly... Serving God should be a joy and should bring peace into our lives because of who God is, not because of whether he's delivering what I thought he was going to deliver or not. Serving God should be joyful and bring peace to us regardless of whatever situation we're in. I will leave you with this scripture so that we can reflect upon it and find joy in it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. When we serve God from a joyful heart, our servitude to Him is never in vain. And that's the hope that we have. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this very day, many of us may be in a state where we think that serving you, that following you is a burden, Lord. I pray that you would give us repentance, Lord. I pray that you would give us the eyes to see your holiness, your beauty, your power, the blessings that you have given us, Lord, so that we may find joy in following you, in serving you, and that we would wake up, Lord, one of these days knowing that we could not do otherwise but to live a life of serving you, of following you, of being with your people. And that that would bring an eternal joy to us that no other endeavor in our life could ever give us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.